I'd now like to introduce Dr. Kevin Harvati. Kevin is currently a professor of nutritional physiology at Penn State University. He earned his PhD and postdoctorate from Cornell University. Dr. Harvatine's research integrates traditional ruminant nutrition and modern molecular biology approaches to investigate the regulation of metabolism and develop dietary intervention strategies to improve dairy production. His specific research objectives include investigating dietary factors that modify ruminal fatty acid biohydrogenation, regulation of synthesis of milk components, and basic regulation of lipid synthesis with the goal of developing feeding strategies to improve the efficiency and performance of dairy cows. Dr. Harvatine, the floor is now yours. Thank you, uh, and thank you for, for having me. Uh, it's, it, it, there's a really great lineup of talks in the Real Science Symposium, and, and I hope that, that my talk today can, can add to that. We've, we've uh, used this as a great resource in, in teaching our grad students and bringing them up to speed. I really want to thank Balkem for uh, the dedication and, and the work that they've done to making that webinar series available. Um, so our, our discussion today is around, around seasonal rhythms, and this has been a little bit of a new area for me to, to get into. So, so I really think of myself as a, a, as a nutritionist, and we do both nutrition and lactation work, mostly focused around, around milk fat. Uh, but a couple years ago, we, we started, uh, we've been doing daily rhythm work, and we started thinking that we could take some of the things that we were uh, had learned to do analyzing daily rhythms and apply them to understand seasonal rhythms. And I have to acknowledge Dr. Isaac Sulfur was a PhD student with me at that time, and he took the lead on these projects, and a lot of the data I'm going to show today is actually uh, from his, his work. He's now on faculty at the University of Minnesota. So I want to start out just, just recognizing that what's really important to our cash flow on farms is the pounds of fat and pounds of protein that's sold. Uh, I think probably the folks on this call re realize that more than I do because the, their, their monthly paycheck every month is, is directly tied to this. But just plotting out what's the cash flow from that 80 pound cow and over the last 20 years, fat and protein value has been where most of our money's coming from. Uh, our other solids is, is not returning very much to us. And I know Dr. St. Pierre would, would argue that quite often those other solids were paying more to ship those than what we're getting paid for them. And also they're costing us money on, on checkoffs and deductions, things, things like that. So I know in the past year, there's, there's been craziness in all parts of our life, as in including milk price, uh, a lot of dynamics over the past year. But I think this general trend has been fat and protein is where our value is. And our best management goal is to, to be thinking about fat and protein yield. So, so that's kind of setting up, uh, we're, we're trying to understand uh, how can we maximize fat and protein yield on our farms. And I think we all probably appreciate that there's a lot of variation between herds and milk protein and fat. This is the um, uh, average for almost 6,000 herds coming out of the DRMS data set. So we have milk protein on the left, milk fat on the right. And this is their herd average for the year. So this is even less variation than if we took those individual test days and looked at those individual test days, right? Uh, so there's a lot of variation across the year. We're gonna talk about some, some what explains some of that. Uh, there would be, but then we have large variation between herds also. So if we look at milk protein, our 10th and 90th is 295 to 32, milk fat 355 to 4.08. So considerable amount of variation, these are only Holstein herds. So this really kind of, kind of gives us an idea of uh, what are the opportunities out there to increase fat and protein percent. Um, there'd be, there'd be the, the, the same or more variation on the yield side, right? Um, so there's, there is variation, there's opportunity for us to make improvements. There's much larger variation in milk protein and fat between cows within a herd. This data is coming from 1,700 cows uh, from five herds that were involved in one of our, our field studies. So here we have 10th to 90th percent uh, for protein being a 2.7 to a 3.5, and for milk fat, a 2.7 to a 4.8. 
So we have a lot of variation between herds, but then also a lot of variation within the herd. So here, when we're looking within the herd, we're taking out that nutritional component and a lot of those management components, and we're actually looking at that cow part of, of the variation. So I just want to show you this to, to kind of uh, help you kind of broaden out your thinking a little bit. I think quite often we get into this set thinking that we're looking at a herd average and we have one goal for that, that herd average. And that is one starting point. But when we start looking at over the year and within cows within that herd, we see a lot of variation. And I think we could do a lot better job of trying to understand that variation so then we could get more accurate and more precise of our determination of when uh, milk, fat, and protein are at their goal and when we could actually be doing, doing a little bit better. So the differences between cows uh, likely influenced by things like days in milk, feeding behavior, uh, uh, genetics, a lot of different, different factors there. Uh, the last comment here is that we think about trying to improve our, our fat and protein yield on farms. There's two ways to think about this. We could go into that herd and we could try to increase fat and protein in all cows. So just move the mean up by moving all cows up. But you know, this cow that's already making a 3.5 milk protein and a 4.5 milk fat, it's probably hard to increase her fat and protein, right? Uh, uh, but these low cows, it's probably a lot easier to increase them, say for these really low cows that have diet-induced milk fat depression. So the other thing we can think about is helping the cows that are on the bottom side of the distribution moving those up, and then we're going to move our overall average. And the thing is, we probably have an opportunity to have a bigger magnitude of a difference in these lower producing, producing cows. It's just a couple, couple things to keep in mind. So milk, fat, and protein is affected by nutritional and non-nutritional factors. So for nutritional factors on milk fat, we can decrease uh, milk fat by milk fat depression. And this is basically all we used to talk about. Uh, with the discovery of CLA around 2000, for many years, we just talked about diet-induced milk fat depression. And it is a big deal, up to a 50% reduction in milk fat. Basically, when you have too much unsaturated fat, too much fermentability, uh, diet fermentability, acidosis, slug feeding, that sets up for disrupted rumen fermentation and a big decrease in milk fat. But the last couple of years, we've uh, realized that we can also increase milk fat a small amount by addition of substrate. So acetate from forages, fat supplements, especially palmitic acid can give a bump. On the protein side, for many years, we've really focused around this amino acid supply. So thinking about maximizing microbial protein synthesis and then uh, uh, adding in or to the synthetic amino acids to balance out and complement what, what we have there. Really important, we can get a small but, but reasonably uh, consistent response to that. Uh, but then the other part of this, I think we haven't thought about as much recently is the energy supply side. So there's effect of starch levels, fat supply, other dietary factors that, that I don't think are as well characterized that have an impact on, on regulation of, of protein synthesis. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of us, a lot of, a lot of the folks on the call are nutritionists and nutrition is really important on the farm, right? Uh, but also non-nutritional factors have a big influence on this. And, and I always say, I used to actually joke that, that I saw this as things I cared about, the nutritional factors and things I didn't care about being the non-nutritional factors. But we really need to care about both, right? So these non-nutritional factors, we have things like genetics, uh, season of the year that we're going to spend our time today talking about. There's effect of time of day, stage lactation, parity, and also an impact of, of, of heat stress. Um, in that heat stress interaction is probably interacting with things like diet-induced milk fat depression. So a lot of non-nutritional factors. So what are we trying to understand? Uh, and if we think about, about our approach to, to increasing milk fat and protein and trying to figure out what we can do to increase these, uh, we can go about doing experiments to determine the response to a treatment. And, and nutritionists are really, uh, nutrition researchers are really good at doing this, where we ask the yes, no question. Does this supplement work? Yes or no? Uh, 
that 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 we do that because we're kind of limited by by the tools that we have and how complex we can make our experiments. But the reality is that it's probably much more complex than that. It's probably that things work in certain situations where they have the opportunity to work. It may not work in situations where they don't have the opportunity to work. But that that's where a lot of our knowledge and I think a lot of our thinking comes in is that should I add this to my diet? Is it going to work? Yes, yes, no. It's probably more complicated. Uh, can we explain differences in response to treatment between cows? I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to make strides there. And then this last one, which we're really talking about today, is explain the variation between cows and between herds. So, so we saw all that variation between cows within a herd. What's going on there? If we look at um, milk fat across the year, there's a lot of variation. What, what parts of that can we explain? So I think by stepping back and parameterizing the influence of each factor on milk fat and protein, we can determine the most influential factors and identify ones that we can manage, uh, but we may have over previously overlooked. So there would be actually a lot of opportunity there to actually identify these things are having an influence and then, then um, uh, start managing them, right? So the reality is that I think when we look at milk fat and protein, it's not gonna be one factor, that that is the major influence. Now, if you have induced milk fat depression, you have a 50% decrease, that's the major factor, right? But within our normal herds, there's probably a, a, a small to modest influence of a lot of different factors. And if we just focus on one of those factors, we're sort of leaving out uh, or leaving on the table a lot of opportunity to have additional impact. So biological rhythms are what, what I want to talk about today. And these, these are repeating cycles that are driven by a timekeeping mechanism uh, in the animal. So, the, so this is actually a, a, uh, uh, a calendar that the animal is keeping track and flipping from one month to the next in, in their brain, right? Uh, so it's actually internal to them. It can be reset or what we call entrained by external factors like the timing of lighting. It'll be maintained if, it's an, if an animal's put in, under constant darkness. And the, we have these rhythms because they're helpful, helpful for the animal to prepare for upcoming changes. So these rhythms fit a cosine function. And this is what that cosine function looks like that we have this repeating cycle. And uh, what's really nice about cosine analysis is that we can take really complex uh, data and really characterize it with two numbers. And that's the amplitude, and the amplitude's from the peak to the mean. And I'm actually going to talk about the range quite often, and that's from the top point to the bottom point. And then the other number is the period. So how long is it from the one peak to the next peak? So we're talking about our annual rhythms. The annual rhythm's going to have a period of 12 months. Months It's going to repeat uh, every 12 months. So seasonal rhythms coordinate physiology, physiological adaptations with upcoming changes in the weather and food availability. So, and there's some really amazing examples in biology, right? So the birds notify south, they notify south. We have some migrating animals. Uh, bears hibernate, right? And not only do they hibernate, but in the, the end of the summer, they're gaining body fat and they're getting ready to hibernate. They go to sleep and then they wake up at a certain time, right? So, so that's being driven by their body knowing, hey, the long winter is coming up. I have to prepare for it, and then I'm gonna gonna go to sleep. In our production animals, there's uh, really strong, robust examples of seasonal breeding in some of our small ruminants. Uh, so they only breed at a certain time of year. Some of the physiological adaptations that are easier to see would be things like hair coat. So uh, heading into winter. We, our, our, the hair coat's going to get thicker, and then coming into the summer, that's going to slick off, right? There's going to be changes in activity and behavior. Uh, fattening and breeding would be other common uh, seasonal patterns. So I quickly wanted to show this figure on seasonal breeding times. So uh, in a lot of animals, we have um, uh, seasonal, uh, basically the, 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 the timing of birth of the young is going to be time to be in the spring. So this is when it's warmer and there's more food available so that mom can 
uh, have nutrients for, for lactation. Of course, different animals have different gestation lines. So this means that they have to uh, become fertile at different times of the year so that they are timing their, the, the, the birth to be that, that spring period. And remember, milk is food for the offspring, right? So it's not all that surprising that when we have these very robust um, uh, systems to time the birth of the offspring, that we would also have systems that would have an influence on lactation that would be providing nutrients to the offspring. Uh, so in this figure, they, they have uh, feral cattle. I'm, I'm not exactly sure where this data could come from, but in, in dairy cows, we've bred out most of our season, seasonality to breeding, but there is still some seasonality, a small seasonal uh, uh, pattern to, to fertility. Annual, annual rhythms can be persist in constant darkness. So sheep, deer, and hamsters express animal reproductive rhythms in total darkness. Birds continue to show migratory behavior even uh, when in darkness year round. So they, they, they'll start getting fatter in anticipation for that flight. Uh, then they'll go into this uh, activity that they kind of mimicking getting ready to, to fly. Uh, experimental, experimental models suggest effect can be trans generational, so actually transmitted from one generation to the next. And I really want you to, to, to understand that these are endogenous or internal timekeepers. So this is the brain keeping track of what time of day it is. Um, so so um, even without those external signals, uh, they, they can keep track and know that they're going to be going into winter or coming into, into summer. Uh, so I, I think a really good way to make this point is the hibernating bear has to know when to wake up, right? Um, and that can't be just influenced, influenced by temperature because, you know, we all know we can get some nice days early in the spring and that would be a problem if, if we're driving signal off of temperature. So with, within these systems, it's pretty well accepted that these systems cannot be driven by temperature just because there's too much variation in that. Um, uh, versus the time time of day. Uh, so there are also daily rhythms that coordinate physiology with changes across the day. We have a lot of interest in these and we've also been investigating these for a number of years. Uh, things like activity and alertness, nutrient metabolism, milk synthesis and feed intake also have strong rhythms and we've done a lot of work with those in our lab. And why do we add these rhythms? Well, they improve survival by anticipating changes and they allow the animal to adapt before the change actually happens. So in uh, the case of, of our daily rhythms, we reduce predator risk, um, maximize nutrient quality of the feed because they're eating during the day and match milk to calf demand and need. So the cow's doing that both over the day, but then also um, over, over the year. So these endogenous timekeepers predict changes in the Earth rotation in, in orbit. Uh, so we are rotating around the sun. So that gives us our 24-hour rhythms of light and dark. And then we're also orbiting around the sun. And this isn't going in a perfect circle. It's actually elongated a little bit. The Earth is also tipped on the axis. So this changes the intensity of our, our light. Uh, it changes the, the day length. Um, uh, and this, the change of that day length is going to depend on if you're farther north or farther, farther south. So how does the cow know what time of day or year it is? Well, we have these environmental cues like light dark that entrain these timekeepers, this timekeeper in the brain. So we said this timekeeper is an endogenous clock. So if the animal goes into constant darkness, it's still going to keep track of what time of day it is. But what's happening is that each day the sun is coming up and going down and at a different time. And that is in training uh, or resetting that timekeeper. Uh, so, so, so it's not that that rhythm is entirely set and is not able to be modified. It's being able, to, it can be modified and it's modified through that light dark signal. Um, that, that timekeeper in the brain then sends signals out to peripheral tissues to tell those peripheral tissues what to do. Uh, we also have some ability for peripheral tissues to keep track of what time of day it is or what time of year it is. 
Um, and in the circadian timekeepers, things like the timing of feeding is actually uh, important to modifying the, the timing of those rhythms in peripheral tissues. Uh, but really, really cool. I, there's a lot of meat, meat stuff in biology, a lot of cool stuff the body does. And, and I think these timekeepers are a good example of that. So seasonal rhythms repeat every year, uh, mostly driven by day length, lengthening and shortening days or change in day length. So I'm showing uh, these parameters on the right for Florida, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And, and I'm going to show you production data from these same states uh, later on. So day length, we have lengthening days up to uh, um, end of June and then shortening days into December. Uh, but we also have a change in day length. So the change in day length uh, is, uh, gets larger as we get out towards the equinox. Um, and then, then starts getting smaller as we get towards our, our solstices. Uh, so, so that's also being um, uh, sensed by the animal. So they know, is the day, are the days lengthening or are they shortening? And how much are they lengthening and how much are they shortening across, across the year? Um, regulate through the same mechanisms as circadian rhythms. And I also have to recognize that they're hard to separate from temperature in the real world. So showing average temperature for these four states, and of course the average temperature across the year in Florida and Texas is higher than Pennsylvania and Minnesota. Uh, so in the real world, we, we cannot separate these. We could experimentally try to separate these in a controlled environment. Uh, but these experiments would be really hard to do because they take a long time and, and, and grad students want to graduate uh, in, in running experiments that take multiple years is uh, uh, not, not, not easy to do, right? So, so we're, we're kind of in the, our real world data, we're confounded by temperature. We're going to talk about that a little bit and why these rhythms, um, we, have, we can support these rhythms are being driven by uh, lighting more than temperature. So I want to show you, show you this neat example of how you can cycle these seasonal rhythms faster by controlling uh, light cycle. So this is in sparrows. They're seasonal breeders, and they have changed in testicular size across the year. And this is actually showing two years of data. So the first top on the top, we have a 12-month a, uh, cycle. So they, they're going into their breeding season, then they're molting, and then they're going into their breeding season in the next year. But then what they did is that they changed the, the increasing and decreasing daylight so that they went through that full cycle rather in 12 months, but in eight, six, and all the way down to one and a half months. And you can see that as they shortened those years, they could actually cycle those animals through multiple breeding seasons. So you know, down on this 2.4 month cycle, they're actually getting them through four breeding cycles within that 12 month, 12 month period. And they're still, it's not perfect, but even at this one and a half month cycle, they're able to, to mimic that seasonal rhythm. So uh, really great controlled experiments to demonstrate in other animals that changing the scheduling of lighting across the year is controlling these seasonal patterns. So we know photoperiod has a large impact on, on milk yield, and a lot of data going all the way back to the 1970s uh, that long days, 16 to 18 hours a day versus 18, 8 to 10 hours of light, uh, increases milk yield and milk fat and protein yield 5 to 10 percent. Very, very consistent response in this, this summary done in 2003. It's eliminated by constant light. So constant light actually uh, remove setting any rhythm, and they go into what's called free running, uh, and, and they lose this effect. There's also an effect of short uh, lighting during the dry period. Uh, so um, with short lighting during the dry period, you get higher milk yield in the next lactation. So that's in our, our solid, um, solid squares. And this is thought that you have more memory development with short days. Um, then you have more capacity for the mammary gland to make milk in the next lactation. This makes sense that spring calving cows normally would be dry during short days, likely driven by increased mammary development. So if we look, so, so, so we have a long history to say that the mammary gland is responsive to lighting. 
Uh, we've, we've known that for, for a long time, right? Uh, so we also have recognized that we have a seasonal pattern to, to milk composition. Uh, so for many years, we've, we've been plotting out this data. We can get the, the data from the milk markets and look at the seasonal pattern for milk fat and protein concentration and, and, and really highly repeating patterns. So I like to look at it this way first. We're just showing 15 years of data. And you say, can you see a pattern to this? Well, of course you can. It's highest uh, in January 1, it's lowest July 1, really super consistent. And this is the first place that I would argue against a heat stress mechanism because our, our temperature is too variable from year to year. We have spring, summer comes early, uh, summer stays later. We have worse summers, we have cooler summers. This is very, very consistent. If we hit that cosine function, R squared is like a 0.999, right? Very, very strong. 0.25 unit change in milk fat, 0.2 unit change in milk protein. We see this across all of our milk markets. Uh, so fat is being shown in the top, protein at the bottom. What we do see is that in this, the more southern milk markets, there's a lower amplitude to that rhythm. So we have less of a change across the year. So pointing out uh, Florida and that Arizona um, milk market. But, but we do have this pattern in, in all, of our, all of our milk markets. So we wanted to move beyond milk composition because what you're really being paid for is pounds, right? So we went to the RMS and got test day records. Um, and this is 760,000 records, 10,000 Holstein herds um, over, over this 12 year period. We picked Florida, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, and Texas. I always have to say this is not an unbiased prediction. Uh, we're in Pennsylvania. The grad student was from Minnesota, and I, I wanted a state representing the, the upper Midwest. Um, and then Florida and Texas, we won southern states, and they were southern states that um, had a reasonable number of herds within, within this database. So if we first just plot out milk yield, milk composition, we see the same annual pattern over, over this data, nice repeating cycles. Now from here, I'm just gonna show you that average year, but I want you to appreciate that this is a continual repeating, repeating cycle. So looking at milk yield, we saw a, a very nice rhythm to, to milk yield. Now it, when, when our milk composition, it was peaking January 1, it was highest fat and protein. When we look at milk yield, we actually see that milk yield peaks in April. So we actually have a different timing that it's closer to our spring equinox uh, rather than, than our solstice. Um, so what's also interesting is that we had a, a larger amplitude and yield for our southern regions than we did in our northern regions. Um, so, so nice consistent rhythm, uh, bigger amplitude in the south than in the north. Uh, but if you think about heat stress again, our lowest milk yields actually occurring well past uh, when we would have peak heat stress. Now you could argue there's a carryover effect, uh, but, but we have lowest milk yield is, is well beyond our peak heat stress. Milk fat peaks uh, at the end of the year uh, and differed by, by region. So if we look at milk fat, uh, we had our bigger amplitude the rhythm in Pennsylvania and Minnesota, those northern regions, Texas and Florida, we had less amplitude, but the timing of them were, was, were very similar. Uh, peak milk fat percent around January 1. Now, milk fat yield is a combination of milk fat percent and milk yield. So since those two rhythms are a little bit different, we get uh, peak fat yield occurring somewhere in between. So around February, uh, we had our peak in fat yield. We have a bigger rhythm to fat yield in our southern regions than our northern regions because we had such a big rhythm to uh, uh, milk yield. The Miner Institute has been uh, working on this uh, prediction of milk fatty acid profile with Dave Barbano. And uh, this is, I think, 40 herds out of the St. Albans Creamery where they've plotted um, uh, milk fat percent is in green on the right axis in milk uh, palmitic acid, less than 16 carbon fatty acids. So those de novo fatty acids is in blue on the right axis. And you can see that they're seeing that annual rhythm to milk fat percent in their data. Uh, and they're also seeing a nice annual rhythm in the concentration of de novo fatty acids. Now, I need to point out that the 
uh, de novo fatty acid axis is actually zoomed in twice as much as the milk fat axis. So the de novo fatty acids are not explaining 100% of the seasonal variation, but they're explaining about half of it. And the other half is, is mostly being explained by the 16 carbon fatty acids because part of those 16 carbon fatty acids are coming from de novo synthesis. So what it appears to be is that we have an animal rhythm to milk fat percent, but that's due to a difference in the capacity of the mammary gland to make fatty acids from scratch um, through that de novo, de novo process. Uh, seasonal rhythms are well conserved between breeds, uh, but we do have greater amplitude in higher fat breeds. Uh, so this is from uh, uh, DRMS da database again. Uh, in looking across different breeds, you can see uh, very consistent patterns to milk fat yield, milk fat concentration. The amplitude's bigger in, in breeds that have a higher fat percent. You could think of it that the, the seasonal rhythm is, a, it is basically changing as a percent of their yield across the year. So if they have higher yields, like in jerseys, or higher percents, um, you end up with a bigger amplitude, but very well conserved across their breeds. It's also conserved by parity. So this is data from um, uh, some uh, uh, herds that were involved in a genetic study from Chad Beckow's lab at Penn State. Uh, and we have first parity in red, second in blue, and then third plus in the yellow. And we have uh, uh, the milk yield, milk fat, and protein rhythms were conserved across all those parities. Uh, we also wanted to know if there's a genetic interaction. So DGAT1 genotype is um, the SNP that explains uh, probably about half the genetic variation in milk fat. So we went into that genetic database that we had SNP genotyping, and we observed uh, no difference between those genotypes in, in any of the circadian rhythms. So it seems to be fairly well conserved within cows. We we're wondering if we could actually identify a genetic type uh, that did not have a seasonal rhythm, but uh, we we're not able to do that. There's also um, an animal concentration to milk protein um, and an annual rhythm to milk protein uh, yield. So uh, we have milk protein being highest January 1, lowest July 1. Same as our milk fat, we have a, a lower amplitude to that rhythm in our southern regions compared to our northern regions. But then when we look at milk protein, we have larger amplitude in milk protein in the south, again, being driven by that larger amplitude to to, to uh, milk yield, but a, a consistent rhythm and the peak protein yields occurring in that early March period. So seasonal rhythms are well conserved. Uh, uh, Isaac's gone on to analyze 130,000 monthly herd averages from 330 large herds from the Diamond V database. You've probably seen some of this data before. Diamond V's done a great job uh, uh, plotting that data and, and talking about uh, expectations, these seasonal rhythms across the year. Uh, so the rhythms were conserved in California, Pacific Northwest, um, Southwest Rocky Mountains, Upper Midwest, similar time of peak, but different in amplitude, similar rhythms in freestall and open lots, 2X and 3X milking frequency also, it's just similar rhythms. Now, there is some very slight statistical differences in this data, but basically nothing that would change our overall view of these, these rhythms. So is this heat stress? Well, we can look at this one way by looking at what does heat stress do, uh, when, what does experimentally induced heat stress do to a cow? Uh, so when you put cows into heat chambers, uh, you see a large decrease in milk yield and they actually observe an increase in milk fat percent and a decrease in milk protein percent. So this is not what we're seeing um, uh, during the summer. We are seeing lower milk yields, but again, not lowest until September, um, but we're seeing lower milk fat and lower milk protein. So not exactly what we would expect. Um, the other thing is the annual rhythm explains the day better data than temperature. So in our in our data, we've got, gotten the monthly average temperature, and we'll run the data with uh, day of the year versus month versus that average temperature. And day of the year fits the data better than annual temperature. Now again, in the real world, we can't perfectly experimentally uh, uh, dissect those two, right? 
uh, but we have good evidence from a number of angles to say that this, this time of year and the daylight change uh, appears to be the bigger driver than temperature. So what do I think is going on? I think we have two seasonal timekeepers. Uh, milk composition is being driven by um, lengthening and shortening days and aligns with the solstice. Milk yield is driven by the rate of change in day length and aligns with the equinox. Um, constant long days appears to be setting the physiology of the spring equinox. So that's increased milk yield with no change in composition. And this has really confused me for a, for a long time. Uh, so when we do long days in the experimental controlled experiments, we get really consistent increase in milk yield, milk fat and protein yield. Why is that not what we see during the summer when our natural lighting would be the longest days of the year, right? Uh, so so I, I won't say that this still doesn't confuse me. Uh, I, we'd still like to experimentally demonstrate this, but this may be because of a concept that's called photorefractoriness. So this is where an animal held under constant condition will revert to the opposite season or to the previous season. So uh, there, there's some really, really, again, really neat complexities in biology. And it seems that, that in it, the biology is built and the animal's built to uh, expect changes over the year, right? And to be modified by these changes over the year. And when those changes don't occur, um, the, the system thinks, well, I must be messed up. Uh, and it flips and switches to, to, to the opposite season. Again, it's been demonstrated in experimental animals, not been demonstrated in the cow, but this is the one piece from the literature that we think might explain this, this disagreement between that long day length data and our seasonal data. So what can we do? First is accurately and precisely change your goals across the year. You should, so our average milk fat right now is at 39395. That should not be your goal across the, same, the whole year. Uh, you should expect this 0.25 unit difference in fat, 0.2 unit difference in protein. We have adjustment factors that we published in uh, our 2002 paper that would help you plan in to adjust those factors. And I really encourage um, uh, nutritionists to sit down with herds and, and set up goals for the year and herds to set up those goals for the year. So then they, they can benchmark against themselves or have those goals uh, rather than just being a constant same goal. And I really think what this does is it helps us keep from chasing ghosts and, uh, and also not losing opportunities. So the figure, this would be say if your goal is to 375 milk fat across the, the year. Well, when you have this rhythm, if you had the orange rhythm, you would, you would be happy in January, right? But you, but you probably should be doing better, right? There's lost opportunity. Now uh, you come to the summer and if your goal is still that 375 and you drop below it, now you might start spending a bunch of money trying to increase milk fat when, when you're at exactly where you should be, right? So the first thing is let's program this in. The other thing is that I think we need, may need to be changing the inputs in our model to account for that change in requirement. Um, there's probably some variation in there on how much we update our inputs, but if you're really trying to zero in on your amino acid balancing, when that cow has the capacity to make more milk protein during the winter, we should be accounting for that to make sure that we're not shorting her. Uh, so that we're not cutting off that, that peak, right? Average milk, fat, and protein have also been increasing. Just want to show this is uh, over the last 10 years, milk fat at the top has been on this linear increase in the Northeast and Upper Midwest markets. Milk protein percent, we've been on linear increase uh, over the last 20 years. So we should also be modifying our goals over, over time. Secondly, uh, we do not have an experimentally valid validated way to manage out of seasonal rhythms. Um, and I always like to be careful because I, I like to, to speak from the research data. Now, I don't have demonstrated research data uh, on how to manage out of this, but I think we can learn from the biology in the, lit in, in, in the literature, right? So constant long day photo period is best recommendation for lactating cows for right now. That's experimentally demonstrated. We need the dark phase for that. Uh, and it's a lot easier to turn the lights on than it is to turn them all off. We have to be conscious of, of 
light pollution there. Uh, think about short day lighting for dry cows, uh, at least for the short days of the year. So if those dry cows are in a separate barn, let's not leave the lights on all day in, in or uh, all night in that barn. Um, let's get those lights on a timer, let's get them out. So at least during the winter, they have short days. Now during the summer, we would have to block light out of that barn. For some barns that might be easy to do, for some barns that might just be impossible. But but uh, think about that for at least part of the year. It is possible that if you had really good light control, you could cycle cows faster through the low yield season and keep them for a longer period of time during the high yield season. So if we think about those sparrows that they sent through multiple seasons within the year, we could time it so that we got cows up to that peak uh, period and then move them quickly through the low period uh, to cycle them. Uh, we don't have the data to demonstrate that, but if you had really good light control, you possibly could do that. Some other things to think about that I think are just good, good recommendations. Remember the capacity for milk fat, especially de novo synthesis is highest in January. We don't want a shorter. So this is something we don't have data on, but I think it's uh, uh, reasonable to think through is it might be a good time to feed more digestible fiber. Good forages if you have brown midrib corn, uh, high digestible non-forage fiber. You might think that milk fat's low in the summer. Maybe I should feed this stuff during the summer to push milk fat. Well, it's kind of hard to push, push production. Not saying you, you, you don't want to feed good stuff during the summer, but I think when that cow has the biological capacity to make de novo synthesis during the winter, you want to make sure that we're not nutritionally holding her back. Um, make sure you're not hurting peak production in the spring. Provide enough feed, uh, limit overcrowding, right? So we, 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 we're we gonna be feeding more feed in that spring when that cow's making more milk. If we can not overcrowd, that would be the best time where we can get that cow to express her capacity. Uh, try not to make things worse. So account for energy needed when outside of thermal neutral zone. So too hot or too, too low. Really, this is changing our protein energy ratio. So we need, may need to think about some rebalancing there. Um, manage to reduce the additional effect of heat stress during the summer. Sometimes people come out of me giving this talk and they think that I'm saying heat stress is not a problem. No, it is. It's a big problem. It's a separate problem though. We have a seasonal rhythm and then we have heat stress. So think about cow cooling, watch feeding behavior, uh, silage and feed availability, uh, or silage and feed stability. So at the silage phase and in the feed bunk. So those are the effects of temperature that can change over the year and can be causing additional uh, effects, right? So we could be making this natural seasonal rhythm worse by having these other changes that are occurring that are outside of what that internal timekeeper is keep is doing. So six, fixing these seasonal management issues for corn silage, try to have enough carryover, factoring that increased fermentability as it's stored. Maintain herd days and milk through good repro program. There's some seasonality and fertility plus heat stress. Seasonal pattern and colostrum synthesis appears to also happen and is the lowest in the fall. I hear about this from the field. Uh, I, I don't know of data on this. Um, it would make sense that in September, we have our lowest milk yield, uh, that that may also be limiting the colostrum synthesis. Uh, so number one is make sure you're stockpiling colostrum, that you're, you're expecting that going into the fall, I'm not gonna be getting as much. I need to have it, have it, it stored up. Uh, short day lighting during the dry period may also help, but again, that's not been investigated and I, and I appreciate that's gonna be hard to do during long summer days, you gotta block that light out. Okay, so our key principles to wrap up here, there is a seasonal rhythm of milk yield and composition that varies by region. So we need to change our goals across the year. Manage for long day photo period is a well-supported recommendation requires a dark period of the day. We need to get the lights out. Uh, right now, we do not know how to eliminate these rhythms, but we should try to not make them worse. So uh, heat stress that can add to this on top of the seasonal rhythm are forage changes, et cetera. 
Okay, I uh, recognize the people that do the hard work in the lab. So I'm, my current lab members and previous lab members, like I mentioned, uh, uh, Isaac Sulfur was a, a key person in the lab uh, working on our seasonal rhythms. We've also benefited from funding from uh, USDA and a number of industry, industry sponsors. Thank you again for, for having me and I, I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thank you, Kevin. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in the attendee control panel. Dr. Harvatin, uh, first question here is, if seasonal rhythms occur in constant darkness, what controls the rhythm in that case? Yeah, so, so basically it's, it's the cow's internal timekeeper that is still running and um, and you, you could kind of think of this as a roller coaster uh, and, and that, that timekeeper is just going to keep running, right? Now to change that, you have to change your, change your, your input into it. And, and the other one that, that people probably can appreciate is if we think about uh, uh, our um, circadian patterns, if we put you in, in a dark room that had enough food in there, uh, you would you would go through your normal day. You would get tired tonight. You would go to bed. You would wake up tomorrow about 20 minutes later than you did this morning, and you would keep that pattern over time. Um, it, it's it, without having light signal. But when we wake up in the morning and that light comes on, that resets us. So the same thing's happening to the seasonal pattern. So theoretically, if a heifer was exposed. To, to natural light when she, when she was being grazed as a heifer. And then she comes into our barn and she's under constant light. She's probably still running off of that seasonal pattern that she learned as a heifer. Um, and she's gonna keep running off of that until we change our lighting schedule. And then we'll retrain to what the lighting schedule is. Very well. Kevin, I spend a lot of time in front of a computer looking at a computer screen, and I'm told that the blue light that's emitted will interfere with my sleep patterns. Hopefully that's what it is. I think getting old may have something to do with that. But nonetheless, what does uh, uh, light color have to do with any of this? Yeah, so blue light is the strongest signal to, to these systems. Red light would be the, the weakest signal. Um, so uh, I, I know in our, in our lighting, uh, I remember reading a lot of articles back in the early 2000s when, when a lot of the work on photoperiod was being done and, and they would go in and measure light intensity in barns. Um, and that's part of it is that we need enough total light intensity. But now with LED lights, we, we have a lot of opportunity to select wavelengths and we'd really wanna select within the, the, the blue part of that spectrum to have the strongest signal. Uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that we need enough intensity, but the other big thing is we do need this dark period. And, um, you know, every year you, you, when it comes summer, you probably hear stories about uh, research that's shown that camping is good for you, that when people go out uh, wilderness camping, that they, they come back with a stronger daily rhythm and they can actually see improvements in their immune system. And in a in number of other other functions, and what it's thought is that that real true darkness is needed to set that pattern. So I think that's our bigger thing on dairies is getting getting dark. So lights out in the barn, 
keeping light pollution, so those floodlights from outside from coming in. Uh, if we have to be in there at night, dim red light is our is, is the solution. It seems like we might have lost Scott's audio. <laughs> okay. So, so Kevin, it, this is Clay Zimmerman. I'm going to ask the questions now. Great. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. So Kevin, do these regional do these seasonal rhythms occur at the equator? Yeah, so um at the equator, you're, you're going to have very, very little to no. I mean, there, there's probably nowhere where we have like zero. <laughs> um, I, they, so, you know, I, it, people often bring up, how, do we have any data from uh, cows at the equator or cows in the Southern hemisphere? And we've not been able to figure out where to get a database that would not be uh, confounded by uh, feeding practices. So, so a lot of our, our um, a lot of herds in those regions would be under pasture management, which is going of course going to create create a whole separate uh, difference there. So we don't have any data in the cows in, in cows. Uh, I think what you're going to see is a continuation of what we see um, moving south to north in in the US, but I uh, uh, that that rhythm's going to probably dampen down for for milk fat percent. Thank you. So Karen asked the, the question: Can you manipulate environment and diet to maintain the seasonal peak in fat and protein yields throughout the year? Yeah. So I I I think you probably cannot overcome it with diet. Um, you know, it, it, this kind of goes back to that push versus versus pull. You know, I I, I think we can certainly uh, limit cows by by not providing the nutrients that they need, so we can cut off that peak. But um, part of this pattern is, or, or or not part of it. I think most of the circadian uh, regulation is occurring at regulation and gene expression. So uh, in that low part of the year. The cow has turned down expression of those genes that make milk milk protein. Now you would have some opportunity for mechanisms like um, amino acid supplements that impact mTOR that turn up gene expression. But my guess is is that they probably turn up gene expression equally across the year. So you would get that benefit, but you're not going to be able to get to to make up all that difference. Okay, Isaac asks, uh, you mentioned not chasing ghosts and not missing opportunities due to natural swings. Do you really get a greater protein response in this case if your amino acids supplementing in spring versus summer? Uh, what is the response the same, say 0.15 percentage units increase in milk protein percent? With amino acids supplementing, regardless of the time of the year. Yeah, you know, unfortunately, we don't have the data to to know that. And um, you know, we we've started in our papers to actually try to remember to publish what time of year the experiment was ran in. And and I think if we if if we all start doing that, we could start doing meta analyses to see if we can pull out variation in response across the year. Um, but, but right now, we really don't have any data to, to directly demonstrate those, those interactions. Um, I, I think one of the logical ones would be is that when that cow's making more protein, uh, her amino acid requirements are higher, right? So that the, the chance that she's deficient is, is bigger. Uh, so when you go in and, and you're balancing, that's where I think we should be um, modifying that. And, and I know this this always comes back to again a kind of a chicken and an egg. So so if you if you balance for low production, you'll end up with low production, right? So so uh, we we don't want to be totally taking all that milk protein out of 
out of our, our equation uh, during the summer. But I think we also uh, want to be realistic in that expectation that, that we should be balancing for higher milk protein in January than July, just because that's, that's what the cow is, is doing. Uh, but yeah, I, 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 I think there probably are some interactions. Uh, if you look at response to any nutritional treatment that we have in the literature, there's variation in response. And we do a meta-analysis to get an average response, and we feel good about that when we can say, on average, there is a response. But I think it would be really cool to know when we get the biggest responses and to explain that, that variation. Okay, uh, Brittany asks, does the parlor need dim red lighting uh, for night? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we, we haven't done lighting experiments ourselves, but when you look at uh, the lighting literature, it does not take much light exposure to, uh, to reset these daily rhythms and, and since they're in the same system, these seasonal rhythms. Uh, and this is part of the reason I have not undertaken lighting experiments. Uh, so in, in these really well-controlled experiments, they actually have double doors. They go into a dark room and then into the, the, the room because just opening the door can be enough light to, to entrain some of these rhythms in, in some of the rodent models. Um, you know, but with that said, um, uh, talking to Jeff Dahl in their short day dry cow work, he said they didn't go through major uh, efforts to block out all light. They, they had an old pole barn that they renovated to, uh, to a pack, bedded pack. They, they had the doors closed, but there was still some light getting into, into the, the building. Um, so, so I think those cows coming through the parlor, if the lights are on in the parlor, uh, that's, I think that's going to disrupt a well-controlled lighting, lighting scheme. You know, I, I, I know parlors are expensive, but uh, I've, I've liked kind of throwing out the challenge that um, there's, there's value to 5 to 10% more milk. Uh, there's also a lot of data to say that working night shift is really bad for you. Uh, it's probably not the greatest for the cows too, because she wants to rest and relax. And I think we, we might want to, in some situations, figure out if we can modify management so that, that we do get a night period and a rest period uh, built into that daily schedule. Thank you. Uh, Bill asks, is there a difference due to type of light, uh, for example, natural light versus artificial? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the, just just on, on resetting the rhythm, the blue light is the strongest in resetting the rhythm. Um, you know, I, uh, so, so I, I, I don't want to say that the, the animal's not going to be distinguishing natural light from uh, artificial light, especially if that artificial light is um, a narrow part of, of the spectrum. So uh, again, we, we don't have any data data on this, um, but but I think it I think there might be some opportunities there where the cow um, would would be sensing that natural light versus versus uh, uh, artificial. The other thing is that that with the tilt of the earth and in in, in um, movement closer to the sun and away from the sun. There's also some light intensity things that she may be able to distinguish. Now, those are are probably going to be more like secondary in trainers. They're going to be weaker than than doing a well controlled uh, blue light type scheme. Uh, but there's probably opportunities where where they're having smaller influences. Thank you. Um, Glenn asks, could the fact that milk yield and maybe uh, component yield, uh, or excuse me, could the fact that milk yield and perhaps milk component yield lags behind the highest temperature be related to milk yield not being very elastic, not being able to, to rebound from the depression resulting from high temperatures? Yeah. Um... 
you know, I, I, I think there's a number of, of possible opportunities there. You like that rebound, I think you would still be kind of expecting the lowest to occur earlier, right? So when you look at that pattern, you know, um, and that pattern's really consistent in, in our in our different regions. So like if you go to Florida, you have considerable heat stress by June, uh, but milk yield is still much higher in June than it is in, in, in July. Um, when we put cows into experimental heat stress, the response is rather fast. Um, I, I don't know that data well enough, and I don't know if they've actually published like the recovery, what the recovery periods look like. Um, so, and again, I, I, I don't want to say that there's no effective heat stress because there, there very clearly is an effective heat stress. There's the potential that we have uh, uh, carryover effects from that heat stress. Um, I, I think what we're seeing is too consistent um, and not aligning with heat stress well enough that that this that, that what we're actually pulling is out is that seasonal seasonal rhythm. And if we you know we started out talking about there's all these variables that are going into this, and if we can start um, we're basically statistically um, pulling those apart. So I think what we've pulled apart is that seasonal lighting aspect. And then another component would be a a heat component. Um, now you, you're going to have to experimentally separate those just because there there's too much correlation in the real world. Thank you, uh, Scott. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you, Clay, for stepping in there. Uh, Thirty plus inches of snow here, I think, is having some issues with my internet. Uh, and also want to thank Kevin uh, and uh, everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them along with the unanswered questions from today's session. The Real Science Lecture Series webinar for our monogastric listeners will be later this month, February 23rd, with uh, when Dr. Ryan Dilger from the University of Illinois will share Understanding Choline, an Overlooked Nutrient for Pigs and Chickens. Our next ruminant webinar will be on March 2nd when Dr. Bill Weiss from The Ohio State University will discuss assessing mineral bioavailability and the real-world implications. Visit balchemanh.com slash real science for more details and to register. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. We now have seven episodes out on YouTube and your favorite podcast platform, and also at balchemanh.com slash podcast. We go behind the scenes and hear conversations that take place over a few drinks with friends. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform, and be sure to follow us. On behalf of Balchem and Dr. Harvatine, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.